Okay, uh, we're going to start, so we remain a little bit silent. Uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here on this uh, conference about uh, the Western Sahara struggle. Uh, we welcome you all here. Um, we're waiting for Kim Johnson, the MP. She's going to arrive a little bit later, so uh, yeah, we'll introduce her once she comes here. So we've got uh, many members in here from uh, different backgrounds, uh, activists, political activists, social activists, uh, polisario representative, and I'm going to introduce you to all of them. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we're going to have here, first of all, uh, Ruth McDonald. Yeah, uh, Ruth is a UK and US citizen. Uh, she's uh, an educator, facilitator, and activist in service of understanding across diversity of experiences and perspectives. Ruth was a secondary school teacher for 12 years and currently works with uh, recently arrived immigrants and Arabic language learners on cultural and linguistical exchange. For nearly three months, Ruth lived under siege with the Sultana Khaya family. So she's going to speak a little bit about uh, that experience. Uh, then we have on here on my right, uh, Becky Allen. Uh, she's going to speak on behalf of her own experience in uh, the refugee camps of Western Sahara. Uh, and she's here on behalf of Western Sahara campaign channels and uh, uh, Then we've got uh, Talib. Talib bin Salim is a, is a Sahrawi activist. Uh, with a big presence in social media and a big ambassador of uh, the Sahara as well. um, Then we've got Ken Ritchie. Ken Ritchie is a very, very long member of the Western Sahara campaign. Yeah, he's uh, been there since basically the uh, Then we have Ubi Bashir, which is the Polisario representative uh, for Europe and the European Union. And for last but not least, we've got Sidi Breker, who is the Polisario representative in UK. And we're going to have Kim Johnson, which is uh, the MP for Liverpool and Riverside, uh, coming uh, a bit later. So, firstly, we're going to introduce uh, the conference with a video from Mohamed Mayyar. Mohamed Meyara from the media group Ekid Media is a winner of international award Freedom of Expression of the Union of Journalists 2020. He will tell us about the situation that the Sahrawi population is experiencing and also will show us the images documented by Ekid Media of the violations committed by the Moroccan occupation forces against the Sahrawi people. So the video is going to be there.
with no further delay, uh, we we'll go with uh, Ruth McDonald. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me in the back? Is that okay? okay. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Ruth McDonald. Um, I'm a US and a UK citizen. Um, and I apologize, this might be a little bit raw because last week at this time I was getting on a plane with Sultana, leaving my room. Um, and I'm still figuring out what all this means um, as a relatively newcomer to the Sahrawi community and, and issue. Um, and it's my honor to, to speak and share my experiences and message from the 75 days that I spent with Sultan and the wife and the rest of their family under siege. For international visitors and, um, and unarmed civilian protection, uh, we were organized by a coalition of human rights groups in the United States in, uh, in conjunction with Sultana and her network within Western Sahara. And I was one of two team members who stayed in the house with the Haya family for 75 days of the siege before Sultana left for sure a week ago. Um, during the time that we spent there, it was extremely clear that the Haya situation um, represents a sampling of the tactics that are used to oppress the Sahrawi people, both material or materially, socially, economically, politically, and more. That was incredibly, incredibly clear. Um, and I'm going to speak to the, the ongoing human rights abuses that I personally witnessed in Western Sahara, um, as well as the testimony that I collected about it. Um, the day that we, my team, uh, arrived was the 40, 482nd day that Sultana and Arata Kaya had been confined in their home. Um, they had been isolated and repeatedly attacked, tortured, raped, um, poisoned, and monitored 24 hours a day for all 482 days of that um, by the perpetrators of those crimes. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine what that was like for him within the house in the camp. Um, and their mother, uh, who, as Sultana said in her video, 86 years old, um, was living in the home uh, and their main contact with the outside world. And that meant when the utilities were cut off, when the, uh, the water and electricity were, were down, that it was an 86-year-old who had had her, her shoulders actually um, injured and ripped by the torture that she had endured in the home, having her hands tied behind her back. Um, she was the one carrying her daughter's water. Um, well, they couldn't leave the house. That, that's the kind of indignity that we came into. Um, I can't, before I, before I go on to what I personally witnessed, um, I can't overstate the importance of the international community in this situation. Um, and my status as both a UK and US citizen held incredible power, more power than I anticipated coming into that situation. Um, it's a power that deterred the most brutal forms of violence from, um, from being carried out on the Haya family when our team was there. Um, and, uh, and I'm in a room here in London, I feel compelled uh, to call out the international community and, and all members of, of people living outside of Western Sahara um, because, because the international community is at best um, willfully ignoring Morocco's violence against the Sahrawi people and at worst aiding and incentivizing it. Um, and because of the, the skewed power of the international community that we carried as, as um, civilian protectors, um, we also are aware that the behavior of the Moroccan forces around the Haya family home changed because we were there. Um, and that a lot of the violence that was happening was hidden from us as well as it could be. And even with that change in tactics, it was still incredibly obvious and still incredibly visible. So um, here are some of the things that I saw and unfolded while I was in the house. So up to 20 plain, visible, plain clothes Moroccan police officers surrounded the, ha the house where I was living for 75 days, um, 24 hours a day. We checked at all hours of the day and night, we could always see them. Um, and their role was clear. At times, they prevented people from entering the home, and there was consistent intimidation and always the possibility of violence at their hands. Um, one example is a 14-year-old boy who was detained twice while we were there, and one of those times, he was held in an adult facility overnight. 
um, with no information uh, to his family about what, what had happened or when he'd be released. Um, many visitors were turned away, um, and other visitors who made it to the house later were punished, um, including, as you, some of you may know, Zang Bubadi, um, who was one of the, the community members who joined us on the roof, um, calling for, for human rights um, and, and independence. Um, and for this, she was detained, brought into custody, beaten for three hours, and then when she was released and was walking home barefoot with her clothes ripped, um, beaten twice more by men who pulled up next to her. Um, and, uh, and she had just gone out to buy bread for her children. Um, she has had to have reconstructive surgery on her hands uh, because the bones were so badly broken. Um, and I didn't get to see Zane Abu in person afterwards, so we've spoken up on, on video, but I did get to see Father Mark Hobby, uh, who was beaten with a, a nail-studded club on the same day that Zane Abu was attacked. It was a systematic six of the women who had been in the house were attacked on that day. Um, and, and Fatima uh, had puncture wounds all over her legs from the nails in the club um, that she was beaten with. Um, so visitors uh, across the community, women, children, and even repair workers who came to, to fix issues with the house, um, including Moroccan repair workers, um, one who was in his 70s was beaten for coming to offer services to the Hyde family while we were living there. Um, there were also uh, verbal threats that included uh, visitors to the house being told that when we, the American and international visitors, left, that they would get the same as the highest had. Um, I assisted in a, in a makeshift um, medical clinic where we, we did our best to, to serve people in the community when they were able get, to get to the house. Um, and I saw the lasting evidence of injury, uh, beatings, and also the lack of access to medical, um, medical services and facilities. Um, and many of the people who showed us their scars also brought photos and videos to show us how they got those scars, um, or, or how over time those scars had developed and healed. Um, so much. Um, Uh, well, what I can say is that well, while we were in the house, there were no internal attacks on the house. No, no one got into the house. No one was raped inside the house. No one was beaten inside the house. But it seemed very clear, and it was stated very clearly to the activists who were attacked outside, that the violence was redistributed um, outside of the, from from being concentrated on the highs to being concentrated all across activists in Bushdoor. Um, and I also, of course, saw damage to the house, which included a poisoned well, cut wires, corrosive liquids poured on the walls, um, broken and destroyed furniture, and deliberately clogged sewage systems, which we continually were unclogging and then were getting reclogged outside the house because um, we couldn't protect them. Uh, these are some of the things that I experienced firsthand, and I also, um, I also collected evidence. Um, people entrusted me with their personal stories, and their experiences and brought documentation uh, to show that those stories were true, um, even though their words should have just been enough to be believed. Um, I recorded hours of testimony, and I spoke with many, many Sahrawis informally, uh, both in person and over the phone when they were unable to reach us due to checkpoints in the blockade around the house. Um, each person's story clarified patterns of human rights violations at the hand of Moroccan authorities, and I'm just going to name some of the themes that were brought up, but there's no way that I can even scratch the surface. Um, a total lack of freedom of speech, uh, prisoners of opinion, arbitrary cruel sentencing, forced disappearances, cruel and unusual treatment of children and members of the developmentally disabled community, torture and no legal recourse for survivors of torture, rape and sexual humiliation, especially in front of children and family members, um, beatings in custody, at checkpoints, and in the street, random detainment, suspension of licenses to work, and suspension of pensions, lack of access to education and health care, uh, cultural erasure, consistent, visible, and, and, and spoken threats of violence, um, restriction of movement and travel within Western Sahara, home invasions, 
theft and destruction of property, environmental and ec economic disenfranchisement, uh, disruption of indigenous values and ways of life, and targeted and brutal disproportional violence of peaceful protest. Um, and what was clear as these themes arose, I was able to write these down just after thinking about what did I hear. Um, these aren't just one individual, and these aren't levied across everyone in the community, but any combination of these can be levied against any member of the Sahrawi community, and that's what, that's what I kept hearing, that any combination of these can be used as a threat and, in reality, to, uh, to, to oppress and, and suppress uh, Sahrawi voices. Um, I don't know how much time I use. Probably about this. Let me stop. I've got a little time now. Um, one thing that I think is, is really important to share is that as international visitors, um, it was very clear that we had a, had a legal right to be there as advocates for human rights. Um, we're lawfully allowed to stay according to the UN's Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. Um, and also we were lawfully in Western Sahara. Um, but nonetheless, we received constant messages that we were unwelcome to stay. Um, my team received warnings from the U.S. Embassy that the Moroccan government had called them, saying that they would forcibly remove us from the house, um, even though we were guests in a private home, um, if we didn't self-report. And this was about halfway through our stay, when we weren't even close to having used up our, our 90 days. Um, this generally allowed for, for folks um, visiting on the passports that we were using. Um, and following that warning, although the house wasn't uh, broken into by agents, it was hit three times in the middle of the night by an industrial truck that broke a wall into a, 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 a room that wasn't being used in the house. Um, and the, the, police's, the police were there. They, they saw what happened, but they made no effort to investigate um, what the deal was with uh, having a, a, an industrial truck hit a, hit a private home three times in the middle of the night to the point where it cracked open a wall um, and exposed the inside of the house. Um, it seemed like pretty, pretty clear evidence that this was condoned by the Moroccan authorities right after they had sent us this message that we should leave. Um, Moroccan agents made several attempts to gain access to the house, um, including three times they dressed up as medical professionals and said that they needed to see us. Um, that included uh, some, one, one time at least where the paramedics, um, the people dressed up as paramedics, were documented tormentors of the Thais, saying that they had come on humanitarian issues to come and see us to check on our house as international visitors. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine if anyone here knows anyone who's been through trauma or has been harmed, what it would be like to have someone pretending to be uh, a medical professional who's been the same person who broke into your home and tied you up and raped you, saying that they're there to, to check on someone's well-being. Um, and then finally, you know, there have been lots of rumors about how my team got into uh, the Hyatt family home. There, um, but let there be no mistake, we entered clandestinely. We did not let the Moroccan government know that we were on our way. Um, we avoided all checkpoints and we evaded the guards who monitor the home 24-7. Um, and when a second international team tried to come openly to, uh, to relieve us, uh, they were forcibly deported from the airport, uh, three women. So uh, I think, you know, here I am, like three months into this experience, I came in not knowing a whole lot. Um, and of course, the Sahrawis know all of this better than I do. Um, and yet I feel as a witness, um, as someone who's just left Western Sahara, um, it's my, uh, and, and of course as a citizen of two nations that have huge international, uh, international influence in, in the broader community, um, I feel like it's my responsibility to add my voice and to add my testimony to, to this forum um, and in, in other forums that are, are treating this, this issue. Um, and what I, I, all I can say is that there's blatant and systematic human rights violations that I witnessed even as a person who was clearly having them hid from me. Um, and even while I couldn't even leave the house where I could only see two directions. Um, and I hope that the Sahrawi people can be heard tonight and in the future. And thank you so much. 
the All Star Artists here who have made space for me. Um, I feel so connected to your community and your generosity. I am a family mashkura, hatta hatta hatta. I really just want to say this. Thank you.
uh, in recent years, we shifted our campaign a little bit towards campaigning against Morocco's exploitation of Western Sahara projects. The fact that uh, Morocco is benefiting from fishing in Moroccan waters, benefiting from growing crops in, in Western Sahara's land. Now, if, if we had uh, tomatoes grown by Western Sahara farmers, being sold in Britain, and the crops came back to Western Sahara, we would be delighted. But they're being grown in Western Sahara by Moroccan companies, and the profits are going back to Morocco. We challenge the right of Morocco to do this under a trade agreement with the EU. And Britain would actually want the case, and it went to the top of that stage to the European Union, and we had, we had a success. Now that Britain has uh, come out of the European Union, well, it seems we're all back to the start. So we have another legal case coming up to press for having a change, so that at least Morocco does not benefit or benefit financially from its occupation of Western Sahara. We know that what we're doing is not going to force Morocco out. It's, 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 it's a drop in the bucket. This is a thing that we feel that we can, you know, that we can actually do. But we do feel that we need to, we need to push, we need to, to move on in building our campaign. We can't, we can't compare the Western Sahara campaign in Britain with, with Spain or other places where there's a much bigger presence and it is a much bigger, it is a much bigger issue, it's been a much bigger issue to start with the world. But there's a lot more that in the future that we can do. And at the moment, I think that what we see is the need for building, uh, for, for renewing the campaign within Britain as a broader movement in which we work together with those who are working, perhaps showing their solidarity through, through cultural activities, those who are arguing for more humanitarian uh, relief being sent to things, bringing it together. But above all, working with the growing number of you who are here in the UK to make sure that Sahara is not forgotten. So that we work with you and we work with you in support of our friends in Polisario so that they can achieve the objectives that they want for the whole territory. Thank you.
So from that we have to have um, many things. One of the most important things that we have learned from that way we start the struggle and the hope will be our best friend to continue our resistance. So that's why I think the Sahara Yaw still will continue to manifest this um, this um, constant resistance in many ways. Because if you look at the refugee camps, we will find that many of the Sahara Yaw uh, join uh, the army as a soldier to defend our land and our people from the Moroccan attacks now. If you look to the side in the occupied territory, we will find that the Sahara Yaw are leading a peaceful struggle against the Moroccan occupation, where many of them are addressing the torture of it and um, by Moroccan occupation forces. Also, if you look at the diaspora, we will find that many Sahara's, many young Sahara's here in the UK, in Spain, somewhere in Europe, but all of them feel and share all the suffering of our people because of all of us, we have families and we have friends in the refugee camps and the occupied territories. So that's why we are here, that's why we are working from Europe. Uh, to let people know all the time about what's happening in, in Western Sahara and to also call on Western democracies to take a real decision to save our people and to end the illegal operation of Western Sahara. And I think this is a, it's a part of that, that work of the system that we try to do. I don't want to take more time because there are many speakers with many things and interesting things to share. So I would simply like to remind that despite everything and after all what's happening in Western Sahara, I'm sure that my people will continue to resist and fight and today achieve their goal to be and I'm sure that the other Sahara will be all of the parents of that. Thank you very much.
it's up to them to decide what will be the prime status of the territory. And, uh, and uh, but unfortunately, Morocco realized since the first day that any any genuine and free post, uh, consultation of the people of Western Sahara will lead to the independence, and that's why they have started uh, making many obstacles. And unfortunately, from the other side, at New York, there were no uh, firm will to to push for the settlement in that direction, and we ended up having those 30 years of diplomatic fatigue that led to the collapse of, 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 of almost uh, of almost every 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 point. On the referendum, we may disagree with Morocco on modalities, and that's why I mean, that's the meaning of the. Uh, an interest of having direct negotiations that we can still agree on the modalities. But the problem that is, is that Morocco refused since especially in like, since the beginning of the two thousand refused the principle of the referendum of self determination itself, which was the, the the pillar, the main pillar of the whole logic of the UN of the UN of the UN efforts. And now uh, they are embarking on this campaign about the economy that I may touch on uh, uh, later on. On the Polisari front, the Sahars who have been very cooperative, who have uh, proven to be really with the will of the to, to, to settle the conflict, who have been very generous in terms of concessions. We have started from the referendum with very clear options in front of the Sahara, the independence of the integration, and also on a very very clear and exclusive basis to identify the people to vote on the, on the referendum on the basis of this kind of census, and we ended up accept, accepting the Vegas plan in 2003, where it is, there would be a period of four to five years uh, under the Moroccan sovereignty with international, with international uh, uh, guarantees, but, but uh, by the end of which the referendum was held in nation will be organized where well, not only the Saharan people will be voting, but also a very considerable uh, uh, number of Moroccan settlers. They will, they will be also given the right to, to, be, to vote. It was very risky and very even unpopular decision on behalf of the Polisari leadership uh, among the Saharans, but we decided to take that, that, uh, that, uh, that risk to facilitate the, the mission of the UN. In the UN, unfortunately, Morocco refused the plan, and in New York, uh, it was all the time business as usual. Nobody is there to force and to oblige Morocco to respect the UN, the UN decisions. We might still have the will to cooperate, and of course, we have also declared that we will facilitate the mission of the Mistura and we strive to. Uh, within the international law and within the framework that is, is, uh, is um, uh, that is the the, the, uh, the context in which the conflict should be should be resolved in the force, but there is just one concession that we cannot make. We couldn't make it in the past. We will never make it. That was around the issue of self determination and the right of the people to determine the final state. We can't make it because it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the people of Western Sahara. And we think that, uh, that uh, it's even on the interest of everybody that the, that the, that the rules of the game are, are respected. And the very central one in this sense is the right of the people to, to for one day of democracy where they will, will, uh, will, uh, will, will vote. Uh, in a referendum of self determination. And in this regard, uh, one of the posi positions that we, we, we comment is the, is the position until now of the, of, the, of the UK, where there is still uh, support for the right of self determination of the people of Western Sahara of being the central point in the whole process of resolving the conflict in, in Western Sahara. It's something that we we salute and we think that the UK, because of this balanced position, uh, has the possibility to play a significant role now in, 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 in this, with this mediation and those efforts now uh, and the task that have been given to the new EU, the new person that we brought, Secretary General uh, um, Stefan uh, Demstor.
Morocco is embarking now on this campaign that we know around the autonomy and that uh, they are offering an autonomy as a way to settle the conflict in Western Sahara. I don't think that they need to explain how this option is very much in contradiction with the international, to the international law because it is uh, a unilateral approach that uh, Morocco is trying to impose on the people of Western Sahara. The Western Sahara is a non self governing territory going through a process of decolonization. Every tragedy knows that the right of people to choose is central in, this, central in this, and the autonomy doesn't respect uh, this. Some of Morocco or some of the media circles that are trying to, to promote this, propo this proposal, they pretend uh, of being that the proposal is a uh, sort of Position in between the, 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 the uh, in between the stance of the two parts, the Polisario and Front of Morocco. First of all, I want to clarify that the referendum is not an option of the Polisario Front. This is a UN option. Our option, original option, was once and remains all the time the independence of, of the territory of Western Sahara, and that's why we have declared the Sahara Sahara Republic. The referendum was a UN proposal and the UN then as a position in between to accommodate the two options that independently from what the Polisario Front thinks or what the Kingdom of Morocco thinks, we uh, allow the people to, to, to decide. So first of all, the referendum is not our option. But then, what is at stake really in the conflict in Western Sahara, the, the substance, what, what, uh, what matters the most is the final stages of the territory. So the Moroccan proposal decides this uh, uh, prior to any consultation of the people of Western Sahara or to the Bulsan Front. So what matters is the final stages of the territory. So then if that was decided in favor of Morocco, nothing left practically for the, for the Sahara people. So it is um, by excellence a win-lose formula for the Moroccans who are doing everything and the Sahara is so it's not really a solution in between, and, and it will never, and it will never, uh, it will never work. And uh, for uh, for the people in the in the in the West, so, uh, our sister Ruth was making this very moving, moving testimony. So that's the kind of autonomy that Morocco is proposing for Western Sahara, and that's unfortunately the kind of autonomy that some of the Western powers are trying to push for, are trying to convince the Sahara that this is the best. Option for uh, for uh, for them. So uh, without really spending more time on this, Morocco is saying that the majority of the people of Western Sahara are living under occupation and that they feel identified with Morocco and that they are prosperous and happy there and that they are enjoying their life and that there is no problem. Just a very little minority is with the police and front in the refugee camps and they are still even. Uh, they are kept under their will uh, and they are just dreaming for the first opportunity to go and join, and join the occupied territories or join Morocco. So that's the case. Why not just for the life in the referendum? Let all those people express this and everybody will be happy and will be happy. So, just to conclude that uh, it's, it's on the interest of everybody. The interest of the people of Western Sahara and the interest even of the people in the region, because it's not only the Sahara people that are suffering, suffering, of, suffering from this conflict. The Moroccan people themselves are also victims of this, of this conflict. All the dreams, all the hopes of a better life are being postponed pending the settlement of this, of this, of this conflict. And the region, the uh, regional relations between the countries in North Africa, they have been really conditioned throughout history because of this, of this conflict. And I think it is on the interest of everybody that this conflict is settled, and settled without further delay, and on the basis of the law, the international legality, and the rules of the game. Okay. Thank you.
human rights in the occupied territories, and also uh, to pay attention to the uh, more than 170,000 refugees in the country. Uh, from the United Kingdom, this territory, uh, this issue is about this.
working right now for more than 20 years. Uh, we're doing a lot of uh, support. So charities is a refugee camp. Maybe in plus it's also like singing in the situation on the ground in the Chicago Airport. And we have the incredible charities that we're doing a lot of stuff uh, with the city of the charities that are helping a lot here in the UK. Plus the board of the Sahara because there are many places we cannot have access to. But our uh, friends have been doing uh, way to help, and they have been able to uh, take the UK government before the Armenian board here winning the case because the UK was born in the Indian and brought it to the Indian from the Sahara. They are doing the cancer that they are giving for that they are incredible. They have been doing great job all these years. And they have managed together with uh, a group of 10 people that are very supportive of the issue of what is hard and so on solidarity. They have managed that the issue of what is hard is on the table of the foreign and commonwealth development office in the UK. And it is uh, it, 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 it is not because of them insisted with the foreign office uh, the question of what is hard would be marginalized. The Thank you very much for the, for the work they have been doing and they are still doing. Uh, they have spent a lot, many, much of their time, <coughs> power, resources. They have resisted with that all these years. And uh, the, the way that have been, we feel very proud of them that the way that our people have worked here in the United Kingdom. Also, I want to thank you, the group of youth, to have you to. Uh, we were very keen to organize a uh, conference here in the United Kingdom, and they said they have managed to uh, do organize demonstrations in Germany, France, Spain, and they needed to come here to the United Kingdom. Uh, England, uh, the United Kingdom now is not part of the EU. They have very, they have many difficulties to travel here, and they wanted to help us, couldn't because of this you know, situation. I want to thank you very much for uh, uh, being the voice of the Sahara people on again in, in this parliament. And uh, come, please come with us, and we uh, are very proud to work with you. Uh, <coughs> the message from the Central Parliament team is also to help us to organize the event here, you know, the roots of the parliament here. Uh, they, they even uh, wanted her to come here to, to be part of the central message. That for very uh, urgent personal business, these people in the head of system. But we are very thankful to Kim Nelson for uh, uh, organizing because, as I said, she and the group of the four plus party parliamentary group uh, have been very active. And in the last year, they have written more than 100 questions to the board uh, Commonwealth and Development Office. So that is, and uh, the board of Catholic Pump, they are insisting questions. Most of them are about human rights and natural resources and the uh, political and military situation going on now on the ground. She uh, says she, she apologizes. Uh, and uh, I will thank the uh, High Commissioner of, of Namibia, which she has here. It was very honored to have you. Uh, and to you, we uh, express our gratitude to the civil government for their steadfast position. Uh, unconditional position to support the Sahara people. Remember that Namibia has won achieved independence through a referendum. And that is what the UN came to do with the Sahara 13 years ago in 1991. Uh, we are also very thankful for the uh, representative from the, the uh, Ambassador of Cuba. Uh, just to tell you that when COVID-19 was hit in the world, uh, we only had two conductors. Uh, uh, in our refugee camps. Uh, they have been doing this since the very beginning of the conflict, even that some conditions are still present with us in those hard conditions in the refugee camps. We uh, are very thankful for that. And also our students, you know, thousands of them have, have been studying in Cuba and they are still students for free. So, uh, to all the rest, I apologize if I don't mention that uh, many of the people here are very supportive to the conflict. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Sidi. Uh, I think we can start.
start now with a round of questions, or if anybody wants to share anything, or have any questions for speakers in here, you are more welcome than to do it now, if you want to raise your hand.